Hello and welcome back to Guillotine's 18th Century Chemist Theater. Today we are going to do one of the more important skills that the first year chemistry student, and that's balancing chemical equations. It's really pretty straightforward. It's it's sort of like chem Sudoku. <laughs> and so we'll review subscripts, superscripts, and coefficients today, and then we'll talk about how to balance them using the trial and error method. Now there are other, are there are other methods out there. Uh, especially the redox method where you actually look at oxidation numbers of elements. We won't talk about that, uh, but it's certainly out there on the internet if you're looking for a different way to balance equations. And for the advanced students among you, it's, it'd be worth your time to check out. But, but for the rest of us, let's just review the numbers involved in reactions first, and that's, of course, superscripts, subscripts, and coefficients. Superscripts, as you remember, indicate the charge of an ion, and you won't see these very often in the typical chemical equation because we're dealing with neutral compounds and so we don't see charges. Now there's a big exception to this later in the unit where we'll talk about total and net ionic equations, but typically you won't see superscripts in an equation. You will see a lot of subscripts. Of course, subscripts are found after an element or after a polyatomic to indicate the number of atoms or ions present uh, uh, of that ion in the compound. And finally, the coefficient is, is going to star in balancing equations. This will be what you're able to manipulate to make sure that the number of atoms on the left and the right hand side of the equation remain the same. You won't be able to change subscripts because that will change the compounds involved. And so we'll show you how to manipulate coefficients in a little bit. But just to review, let's take a look at some uh, sugar here. Um, how many atoms of each are present? I'll give you a second. Go ahead, you can pause the video and figure this out. Welcome back. <laughs> and so you're dealing with, of course, five times six would be 30 carbons, also 30 oxygens, and then five times 12 would be 60 hydrogen atoms. And so that's all you're really doing is you're multiplying the coefficient by the subscript to figure out how many atoms you have. And once you have that skill down, uh, balancing equations is really quite simple. Of course, uh, the ChemBot is here to uh, encourage you through criticism. <laughs> So before we even talk about the technique for balancing, I, I bet you could probably balance this anyway. So um, you can go ahead and pause the video and see if you can figure out what coefficients go in front of the diatomic hydrogen, the diatomic oxygen, and the water molecules. See if you can figure out what coefficients go in front of each of them. Obviously, if there are no coefficients there, the coefficient there is one. And so uh, go, ahead, I'll pause, go ahead and pause the video, give it a shot, and then come back. All right, welcome back. Um, starting as, as is, it's not balanced because we have two hydrogens on the left and two hydrogens on the right. Uh, we have two oxygens on the left, but only one oxygen on the right. And so you just start messing around with the coefficients. Um, and, and probably a lot of you could just figure out that we really needed a two in front of the H2 and then a two in front of the water because that gives you four hydrogens on the left, four hydrogens on the right, two oxygens on the left, and two oxygens on the right. And so really, this technique is called trial and error, and we'll talk about the, the five steps involved in trial and error. But remember that every single equation that you're going to get can be balanced. And so, uh, you know, don't give up. Anyway, so make sure you write the right formulas for the reactants and products. If we give you the names and you have to write down the formulas, you must do that correctly. Writing the incorrect formula will doom you. <laughs> and you might balance the equation, but it'll be the wrong equation. Don't, don't bother writing down any coefficients yet. And then see what you have. Uh, you can certainly make a, some people like to make a chart of this, of how many you have on the left and right. Some people like to jot down numbers around the elements, whatever your preference is. Just try to figure out how many of each element you have on either side of the arrow. It might already be balanced. That's unlikely, but that does happen occasionally. And then step three, balance the coefficients one element at a time. Uh, diatomics, save for last. Lone element, save for last. And the reason you want to do this is because whatever coefficient you put in front of a lone element or a diatomic element is only going to affect that element. If you throw a coefficient in front of some big compound, you're going to mess up a bunch of elements and you're going to have to go back and, and fix them all up. Uh, the diatomic elements, uh, you should memorize, and that's HO and hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and the halogens. Now, technically not all of the halogens. Astonine, um, is a radioactive element. It has a very short half-life, so very little is known about it. Um, in fact, some people say there's about a gram of it on the planet at any given time. And so the existence of diatomic astonine is neither confirmed nor denied. <laughs> uh, but uh, so technically it's all the halogens but astonine. But, you know, if you just say HON and the halogens, you're, you're not going to write an astonine much in a balanced equation anyway. Um, polyatomics, if they show up on both sides, treat as a single unit. And we'll see this a little later. Um, 
But if you have sulfate on both sides, just balance the sulfates out. Instead of trying to break it down into the separate elements, it makes it a lot easier. Um, <coughs> and then finally, when you get down to the last one, if there's no whole number that balances it out, um, double, <coughs> excuse me, double all your other coefficients and try again. Usually that'll work, and I call that the, the doubler technique. And you, of course, have to say that with a very deep voice. You have to go, the doubler, when you use the doubler. Um, but as trial and error goes, that pretty much does it. It, it, if this doesn't work, I usually just scrap it and start over again. Maybe you just got off to the wrong foot. Um, but try to get, you know, try to look at the equations from sort of a meta point of view. Uh, and get way above it, and, and, and usually you can get things to fall into place. And, and, and again, this really is sort of like a Sudoku puzzle, trying to get all the numbers to work out. And then double check your work. Occasionally you will put a coefficient in front of something and you'll mess up something that's already been done. And then don't forget, this is the lowest whole number ratio, so you've got to reduce all of your coefficients to the smallest whole number ratio, not unlike an empirical formula. And so we've got some practice, practice problems here for you. Again, uh, go ahead and pause the video, give these a shot, and then we'll start working through these. Okay, so for the first one there, that's a classic sort of equation. Uh, I've got six carbons on the left, uh, only one on the right, 12 hydrogens on the left, two on the right, six oxygen on the left six oxygens on the left plus two, so that's eight oxygens on the left, and then a bunch on the right. Um, oxygen's gonna be pretty difficult, um, so you'll probably wanna start with either carbon or hydrogen. Um, so we can just start working left to right. Um, you would need six carbons on the other side. Uh, looking at the hydrogens, uh, you would need a six in front of the hydrogen over there. That would give you six carbons and 12 hydrogens on each side. And then I went ahead and threw the coefficients in there. If you look at the right-hand side beforehand, um, you've got uh, two oxygens and one oxygen, um, and you've already got six on the left. And so based on the idea of six and six, uh, that means that you have uh, 12 plus six is 18 on the right. Um, you've already got six on the left in the sugar molecule over there, and so that would leave 12 to be accounted for by the diatomic oxygen, and so you'd have to put a six in front of that. Looking at the next equation, it's a very similar equation. You've got two carbons on the left, one on the right, two hydrogens on the left, two on the right. This looks pretty straightforward. Um, if you throw a two in front of the carbon dioxide on the right, um, that looks like everything should be balanced, but then you end up with five oxygens on the left and you can't put 2.5 in front of O2, so you use the doubler, the doubler. And so the one in front of the C2H2 um, becomes a two, uh, the 2.5 becomes a five, uh, the two in front of the carbon dioxide becomes a four, and then the one in front of the water becomes a two. And so you just work back and forth, and that's how the doubler works. The next one looks difficult, but it's actually pretty simple, because you've got antimony and silicon by themselves, so that makes it really easy. That just leaves the calcium and the chlorine. And I, I'd, I'd probably do the chlorine first. It looks a little tougher. Um, you've got three chlorines on the left, two on the right. The smallest number that goes into both of those. Uh, or that both of those go into would be six. So I'd put a three in front of the antimony chloride and a, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, a two in front of the antimony chloride and then a three in front of the calcium chloride. Uh, once you put a two in front of the uh, uh, antimony chloride, you'd need to put a two in front of the antimony. Uh, and once you put a three in front of the calcium chloride, you have to put a three in front of the calcium silicide. Um, and so then you'd have to put a, uh, a six in front of the silicon to get it to balance out. So you just bounce back and forth, saving the lone elements for last. And if I remember correctly, I think this next one is a doubler also. Um, again, leave the P4 by itself. Um, so you've got KCl on both sides. Those are balanced out. Uh, then you have the oxygens. Again, the oxygen is definitely the tricky one. So you'll want to put a five in front of the potassium chlorate and then a three in front of the diphosphorus pentoxide. Um, so uh, then you'd have to, of course, put a, um, a five in front of the KCl, um, and then that means that you're gonna have to put um, the doubler to get the P4 to work out, because 1.5 won't work out over there to get that to work out. So if you put a three in front of the P4, um, and then a 10 and a 10 and a six, you'll get it all to work out. And again, it's, I'm sure it sounds a little confusing to hear someone talk through this, um, but, you know, put pencil to paper and try to give it a shot, and you should be able to get this to work out. Again, trial and error is not the only way this works, um, uh, but, but it, it, it definitely is probably the easiest way and the most successful way to balance equations. And so that's all we have for today. Just again, um, and there's plenty of balancing practice out there on the Internet. 
Uh, so take a take a look out there, see what you can find. Practice, practice, practice. Thanks for watching, and uh, have a great day.